Hello, everyone. This is Robert Aceves, and we're starting a new episode of MindFit Podcast, and I have here with me Neil Babbins. How are you doing, Neil? Doing well. How about you? I'm good. I am really, really uh, excited to uh, find out who's going to be winning this election, which we don't know yet, but hopefully yeah. soon. <laughs> Yeah, excited is an understatement. I think that uh, everybody's uh, run the gamut of every single emotion known to man since uh, since the inception of the election. Yeah, uh, I've 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 spoken to a lot of clients, and some of them spend the entire session talking about it. But I have to be honest; I have the link open, and I check it every fifteen twenty minutes myself. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, when this is airing, which will be next week, um, I guess by then we'll we'll know who the winner is. Uh, but we don't know that today. We're recording on Thursday morning, which is not, uh, you know, uh, we don't know yet. So hopefully um, it's a good outcome for everyone. And and hopefully there's no protests or anything bad afterwards. Uh, whoever wins, wins. And, and let's keep the peace, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm hoping is that there's no civil unrest. And, uh, yeah. you know, people are, are not, not crazy about it, you know, on both sides. You know, um, I know there's a lot of anticipation. And, um, I, I, yeah, I just, I just, I hope that people just, um, you know, understand that everything's going to be okay. Either way, you know what I'm saying? We'll, we'll mm-hmm. make everything okay. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's just there's so much build up to it. It's so much build up to the result too. It's like we're hanging, mm-hmm. you know, everybody's like, uh, got the results right there. And then there's, 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 there's just some more counting to do and it's delayed and, you know, it's everybody's chiming in and not knowing. And it's just, everybody's hanging in there yeah, uh, waiting to hear a major, major response. So, but I think, I think we're going to be okay. I hope so. <laughs> no, no violence. No civil unrest. Yeah. No need for the National Guard, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. So today we are going to be talking about, we had a question um, from a, a post that you pu- uh, we published this week um, mm-hmm. asking people what they wanted us to talk about. And yeah. um, somebody uh, replied, I'm not going to say her name because, you know, we want to keep the confidentiality on it. But mm-hmm. she, um, she said... I think it would be interesting to hear more about the chain of strategy, strategies that can be built around avoidance, specifically the strategies we employ to, I can't even say that word, sorry, the strategies we employ to insulate ourselves from suffering the same consequence twice and how later in life when those strategies, <laughs> this isn't so many times, become self-defeating, ways to break through the illusion of feeling unsafe. So... Um, I feel like this in some ways talks about uh, self-defense mechanisms and how sometimes those defense defense, um, mechanisms become self-defeating or become a problem for us. And we tend to, um, you know, at some point we used them and they were useful and it helped us. But then in the present, it might not be helping us. On the contrary, it might be hurting us. So what's your um, take on this, Neil? Well, what I hear in uh, the question is the strategies for breaking down defense mechanisms that we've built up over the years in order to keep ourselves safe Mm -hmm. and to keep ourselves from being wounded again after having been wounded initially. You know, when we're kids, when we're adolescents, a lot of wounding takes place, a lot of trauma, sometimes major trauma, sometimes not so major trauma. So when I say trauma, by the way, I don't mean abuse or a major earthquake or suffered through a civil war, genocide. Those are traumatic, which could be even smaller traumas. Um, and we we're get, we get wounded when we're younger. And because we get wounded so many times when we're younger, we develop strategies to work around situations so that we avoid ever having to go back to uncomfortable places again or uncomfortable memories. And what I hear in the question is, is uh, strategies for breaking that down because once we implement those defense mechanisms or parts of self that we call managers or protectors of self, um, that comes a point in our life where they become self-sabotaging because they become automatic, they become habitual, they become ingrained in our personality, and we don't let go of them. So when we're kids or adolescents, we have them strategically and they serve a purpose. But then when we become adults, they no longer serve the same purpose, but we have it that they do. And to let go of them is terrifying because what's underneath is all that wound all that energy that we were trying to avoid ever having to confront again. So to, to, to set them aside would be terrifying. So we tend to instead rationalize it as, well, it's just my personality. You know, I'm a very organized person. I'm always on time. Or I love to make people laugh, you know, or I'm not a morning person. Well, I'm not. But, um, or, you know, uh, 
I, 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 I'm a workaholic, you know, we jokingly say things like that, or, um, I like to, uh, I'm a perfectionist. I'm an idealist, you know, things that worked when we, when we were younger, but are becoming a little bit more, you know, um, limiting and restrictive as adults. Mm -hmm. And, um, she, uh, uh, the person had also asked, you know, uh, said it becomes self-defeating after a while. So it sounds like it's a good thing. So if I became organized and I became studious, let's say, I became a good student to avoid being berated by my father who would always call me stupid, who I became a really good student so he wouldn't call me that anymore because ah, I guess he's an A, uh, straight A's. You know, to, so let's just say that's a simplistic example. Later on in life, I can't do anything wrong. See, I can't make a mistake because underneath it is the fear, the terror of being berated or shamed by say my father, mm -hmm. or maybe even worse, right? So I can't make a mistake as an adult. So I can't ask somebody out because heaven forbid I get rejected. I can't apply for a job I don't think I'm gonna get. Uh, if there's somebody who I think is uh, better than I am and serves as a threat in competition, maybe I'll do something callous to try to get that person to not compete with me so I don't lose. You know, I, I can't, catch myself in a precarious situation because I might be shamed if I do, or I might be the opposite. I might be sort of cowering, withdraw, keep to myself, isolate, you know, strategically isolate. And if I think something is a threat or uh, something is too challenging or too risky, I might not actually, you know, uh, put it, take a step forward in the event that I might be caught with my pants down, so to speak, and be shamed <laughs> or be criticized again. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to do that. So these are very simplistic ways of looking at it, but this is the basic idea. And the thing is, we don't recognize, last thing I should say in this answer is we don't recognize oftentimes what our defenses really are. Again, we think it's our personality traits. We think it's just the way we are, the way we've become, the way we've developed. You know, we, we don't recognize what we do in a pattern. Our, our MO, I call them our MOs, our modus operandi, or our, our, our what we just jump to automatically mm -hmm. our ways of being and we don't catch them you know when sometimes and here's a, here's here's another kicker in today's modern age postmodern age there's a lot of workshops and stuff and work out there programs that make you think you do know what your mo's are but something i've observed in people is that especially when they're in programs that try to try to point out their defense mechanisms or their mo's particularly those people because they think they're doing the work they actually don't see their MOs because they're M they have MOs about their MOs. They're like, I've got all my MOs listed and that's an MO. That's a part of you that thinks you've got it all down. Like I'm really working on myself. That's one of your defense mechanisms. You're really working on yourself. So just work on yourself. Don't announce it to the world. You see what I'm saying? You have to tell everybody you're working on yourself is, is a defense mechanism. So it's layered. People really don't see how layered it is. And if they're, at, if they're wondering what the alternative is, it's what the work that you do, it's becoming Zen, it's becoming centered, it's becoming core, it's, you know, meditating into the self and understanding what part of yourself is actually authentic and what part of yourself is actually you trying to um, be, be defensive, you know, protect right. yourself. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of times it's, it's pain that's driving this, you know, uh, this defense mechanisms because we don't want to experience pain. Nobody likes pain. And a lot of times also we... Well, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I'm just kidding. I know some people are into that. But <laughs> right. Yeah. Well... Um, Not me. Don't worry about me. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, yeah. Yeah. So what I was going to say is that a lot of times this defense mechanisms are, you know, a way for us to, to uh, move forward in life and, and not, you know, be uh, halted by this painter, like feel like we can't move forward in, in some way. So we tend to either be in denial of something that causes us pain or we rationalize things, right? To make them sound like, oh yeah, this is why this is happening. And one thing I learned in school after many, many years of schooling is that we human beings are very good at, uh, at justifying things. So we do things, a lot of times we don't even think about why we do things. And then later comes the justification like, oh, yeah, I did this because of this and that. And then we, we rationalize it and, and make it seem like we are, like you said, sound people that know what we're doing. But in reality, a lot of times we don't know what we're doing or why we're doing it. And, you know, understanding these things, it's important because in the present, we may want something, but, you know, these things could be, you know, from our past could be stopping us from, from 
moving forward. And we don't realize it because we think that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing because that's what we've learned and we've been doing it in, in a habit, right, for so long that it becomes our life. Right. And, and she had asked the question, what are some strategies for pulling that apart? Um, mm -hmm. So one way we can look at it is try to recognize patterns in your life. You know, um, rec say, let's just say with relationships, when people did a lot of dating, you know, up until the uh, time that they met the, the one, what was your MO in terms of getting out, let's say getting out of a relationship or moving on, either breaking up with somebody or ghosting them, which is something I can't stand. But I mean, um, you know, what, is, what, what, was your, what was your exit strategy in a relationship? What was the deal breaker? What was the point where you said, okay, I've had it or you lost it or you cut, cut ties or whatever? What was the build up to that point? And is there a pattern in when you decide to throw in the towel and how you decide to throw in the towel? Do you ghost? Do you disappear? Do you withdraw? Do you create problems that aren't there so you'll create conflict to give you a reason to break up the relationship? Do you um, tell somebody, sit down and tell them what is unacceptable behavior at a certain point? Is there a pattern for you? Is there a certain kind of relationship you always seem to get into? Is there a certain kind of drama that always seems to ensue? Is there a certain kind of person that you always seem to attract? You end up saying, how come I'm always dating jerks? Or how come I'm always dating un un emotionally unavailable people? Or how come I'm always, everything's good for the first six months and then by the seventh month something goes sour? Is there a pattern? And if there is a pattern, try to identify within that pattern what is common in terms of how you show up each and every time it, within that relationship. And at what point you become activated, in other words, afraid or fear, what's the core emotion underneath that you start to become activated by? And you, can you identify your defense mechanisms in that pattern? How come you bail at that point? What happens if you would stay a little longer, even when you totally convinced it's time for you to bail? What if you didn't ghost when you really want to ghost and break off communication? What if you actually you know, put forth some communication. What if you did something anti what you normally do, right? Because we defend that, like you just said, we defend it. We say, well, I don't have to take that from somebody else. Like, I'm not saying you have to take abuse. I'm not saying you have to take that. But at what point do you break? At what point do you say, I can't do this anymore? Okay, so that is an example of where your MOs, your defense mechanisms, parts of self might be and might be acting in a pattern. So that way you could take a look and say, you know what, I do that. Every time I start to feel that or threatened in that way, and I don't even recognize that I feel threatened that way, I do that. You know, I cause an argument or I disappear or I withdraw or I start to spend more time outside the relationship or I start to look for flaws in my partner or I start to worry more about flaws in myself. What, what, what is your, you know, what is your MO? So patterns. What, and it could also be with work, say with jobs. At what point do you get into a conflict in the office? At what point do you get into a conflict with your boss? At what point do you say, okay, I'm out of here. I'm going to start looking for something else. Now, I'm not saying that it's never right or wrong to get out of a relationship or to move on from a job, but I'm saying, is there a pattern? Okay, so recognize patterns is one strategy. And the second thing I'd say is notice at any moment, once you know what is uh, something that you do on a daily basis that seems habitual, seems automatic for you. I'm not necessarily talking about morning chores. I'm talking about the way you do morning chores. You know, I got to do this first. I got to do that first. I got to finish this before I do this. Or are you a multitasker? I'm distracted. I'm all over the place. I'm always frantic. I'm always stressed. I'm always, or I'm always very lax. You know, it takes me like 20 minutes to get up. And by the time I get up, I haven't done half the things I need to do. So I'm always late. What is your, you know, your thing. And if you can identify what your thing is in the moment that it is, you know, the organizer, you know, the perfectionist, the, uh, the humorist, you know, um, the one who knows it all, the one who knows nothing, you know, uh, what is your MO? If you catch your MO in action, it's a part of you that is trying to avoid pain. So there's something going on underneath your MO. And see if you could identify what are you feeling right now in the moment. And I guarantee you it's probably an uncomfortable feeling, and that's okay. So if you could identify what you're doing as a defense mechanism in the moment, you could identify what the feeling is underneath it, either through a pattern or from a moment-to-moment -moment basis. 
So that's what I would say to start. Okay. You know, now, yeah. what I would say on my part, I think um, this is something I learned in Japan that I loved. My mm-hmm. teacher would say that when you're sitting in meditation, you're not you know, hurting anyone anymore, uh, including yourself, because you're just practically not moving. Uh, when you stop thinking, you also you know, stop creating those thoughts that are creating that reality that you have in the present. So by not thinking or moving, those two things, we are already starting to change something in us. Um, and a lot of times, you know, the, uh, in Japan, uh, the thought, and we've talked about this, uh, it's considered a, a poison because our thoughts can, can, that we're creating could be causing us you know, to be, you know, self-defeating ourselves, to sabotage ourselves, to make ourselves feel like we're not worthy of something or that we could find something better somewhere else. Those things, those types of thoughts, you know, tend to not, you know, put us in the present and seeing what we have in front of us when we have it in front of us. And we can, if we can be present, fully present and, and really experience that moment and that love for that person that we have or for ourselves, then, you know, it'd be easier to start creating a new reality, something that we want, that we choose, that is more, uh, not just an automatic, you know, because these things could be automatic. They just come up from the past because like we've mentioned earlier, this is stuff that we learn to react in certain ways. We learn to act uh, and do things a certain way. But if we stop doing those things, period, without, you know, trying to make it better or worse or whatever, just stop and, and take a step back and to just really ground ourselves and come back to this moment and really see what's going on objectively without putting any emotion into it without you know um, adding to the situation perhaps that's the moment where we can start realizing new things and 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 what we're doing and how we can we want to move on from that point forward and and the idea is always to to think of what ways we can improve our lives and 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 commit to things that are things that we want and not things that we're just reacting to, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's a, that's a good point when you talk about things that we're reacting to. Because um, I tell a lot of people, and I tell myself this as well, that um, it's um, it's okay to feel mm-hmm. you know, uncomfortable feelings or discomfort, um, but it's not okay to believe their stories. It's okay to have feelings. It's not okay to believe their stories, the stories of the feelings. In other words, the meaning behind it. So let's say um, you you do something and you get rejected or you, you know the answer is no. Um, you feel sad, you feel helpless, maybe you feel vulnerable, but then you start telling yourself something about it, usually something from the past, like you said, thoughts. You start to have thoughts about it. Oh, see, I'm a loser. You know, I see, I, to- I told you you shouldn't have taken a risk. I told you you shouldn't have said anything. This is the voice in your head, you know, um, or, or, you know, yeah, that serves you right. You know, that could be your mother's voice, or your father's voice, or, or your teacher's voice. You know, it's a story. It's a narrative that's connected to an uncomfortable feeling. Feelings are just feelings, and they're not going to hurt you. They're not going to feel good, but they're not going to hurt you. What hurts you is the stories that you start to tell yourself after you've had them. You know, and the stories that you tell yourself after you've had them is what brings the MOs back, the defense mechanism back, saying, I told you, don't do that. Don't approach somebody like that. Don't, you know, whatever. Don't do whatever you just did because you're just going to get burned, right? Mm -hmm. Because you told yourself a story about it. So what? You got, you got rejected. So you got, you felt sad for a moment. How long did you feel sad for? If you're not thinking about it, maybe 60 seconds and then you're not sad anymore. And then you do it again. And then somebody says, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought I was a loser. How did this happen? Right? So if you don't tell yourself a story, you will try again. It won't be self-defeating to have the MO because it's not a bad idea to have certain cautions in life, right? To have certain traits that you've developed that you could use when you need them. But if you use them automatically and habitually without any self-agency, then you're automatically going to self-sabotage. It's going to be self-defeating because you're never going to take that leap. You're never going to recognize what you're doing over and over in a pattern. Yeah. And I do like what you say about being grounded because when you're being grounded, you're not having any thoughts and you're letting you know your, yourself go back to a core, so um, you know, in sense of relaxation, which is really what's at the at the root of it too. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, just when when you were talking just now, I got this. I remember this this. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the the gambler's fallacy. Gambler's, I have, but remind me what it is. So, I so, the name. so this is one of my favorite parts that I learned in school is that 
there's this thing about uh, this fallacy where you you go gambling, right? You go play uh, blackjack, for example, and you you make your bet, and let's say you lose, and then you try again, and the second time you lose. Well, the third time you may think, oh well, I already lost twice. What are the chances of me losing again? And so you bet again, and hoping that this time you are gonna you know win again or win this time, and and then you either win or lose, and and the idea is that eventually, at some point, you have to win, right? Because you've already lost all these times. There has to be at one point where, you know, by chance, you're going to win one of those times. But the idea, the truth is that each time you're betting on those cards, you it's, it's an independent bet from the last one. So each moment is unique. But we, in our minds, we connect it and we think, oh, yeah, well, if this happened, then this is going to happen. And we start thinking that every moment is connected to the, the last one. But right. in reality, it's not. We connect them. We bring that connection to things. And, you know, I think about this when it comes to relationships a lot because I see it all the time. You know, people go into a relationship, they end up getting hurt because somebody cheated or something happened. And then they go into the next relationship and they're just almost like waiting for it. Like, okay, what time, when is this going to happen? But each the relationship, yeah, each relationship is unique. And when we are, when we think of relationships in that way, that they're unique and we don't bring our, you know, I call it trash from one to the other, then our chances of succeeding in the present relationship are much higher because we we're not bringing all this junk into this new relationship. And so the same with, you know, uh, gambling if we are going to be gambling just make sure that you you know that each time you're gambling it's a unique experience and you know you may not want to gamble if if that's not your thing and i, I don't recommend it but you know if you are then just know that each time is going to be unique and not because you lost 100 times means you're going to win this time <laughs> so yeah it reminds me of uh that there's no such thing as a lucky streak mm -hmm. i think that's what i remember reading about is that every time you th you toss the dice right if it's like uh odds or evens, you might say, wow, I, it's been even six times I'm on a lucky streak. But in actuality, you're not in a lucky streak. Mm -hmm. You had the same exact uh, proportion where it could be odds or evens each time you roll the dice. There's no such thing as, you know, you're on a lucky or a losing streak. There's mm -hmm. no such thing. It feels that way. But each time you roll the dice, there's the exact same mathematical equation of this, whether it's going to be odds or evens. Mm -hmm. So when you go into a relationship and or a job, like we talked about earlier, the only difference is that you're bringing with you your patterns, right? Mm -hmm. So self-defeating strategies that the, uh, the uh, uh, client asked about, right? Um, and the mechanisms for that, the, uh, the difference is that you're bringing a pattern with you into work and relationships. It's not just a roll of the dice, but that's the idea, is that you have a whole new shot at something if you can recognize what your pattern is. So if you roll the dice a certain way, let's just say, I mean, it's a lot of science that goes into mathematics and you know, algorithms about how you roll a dice. But if you roll a dice exactly the same way, even if you think you're doing it differently, but at the very end, you do exactly the same thing and the dice comes out the same way, you might think you're on a losing streak if it's always odds when you want it to be evens. Let's just say that's a metaphor for a relationship. If you recognize how you're rolling your own dice, then you can recognize your pattern. And you can say, you know what? I do that at the very end. I flip my wrist that way and I, and I drop them down that way. And I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that when it comes to dice. I get it. But ultimately, they land the same way because you've thrown them the same way. So in order for it to be really a 50 50 chance you know what i'm saying or mm -hmm. or a new fresh start you have to understand what your pattern is every time you go into a relationship or every time you go into the rolling of the dice what you're telling yourself every time you roll the dice see so there's a difference between like like random luck like really truly luck of the draw and what you're bringing to it so people shouldn't get into the habit of thinking well my next relationship will be better yeah your next relationship has a chance new roll of the dice but what are you bringing to it because i often say you know you got to look know your own suitcase because doesn't matter what international airport you're traveling to you know it's not being in a new city is wonderful but you've got the same backpack on so you know you're, you're going to unload the same backpack so be aware of the backpack what's in it and how you want to use that differently and how you like you say how you want to ground yourself so that it really can be a new roll of the dice every time you do something new right and also you know think about that content of your suitcase those are your thoughts those are your experiences this is how you think about life and and if you change those thoughts and if you start changing 
you know, the content of that, then obviously the result will be different. So mm -hmm. it's important to, to be mindful of those things and be mindful of your actions, like you said, because we have so many things that we do out of habit. And the reality is that every day we have the option of really doing anything we want to do. There's really no, no limitations except for the ones that we put ourselves. And, and that's the thing that I always tell people when they come to my office, you know, when they, when we finish our session, they can walk out and literally go anywhere in the world and do whatever they want to do. And yet they're going to follow whatever they already have in their, in their minds, which is, to go home and or go to work or do whatever they do on the on a day that they they came and we already have those things you know pretty much mapped out for the rest of the week and we we know what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be reacting to things and the idea here is how can we improve that and and change things a little bit so that we can have a better life and and not allow those things from the past self defeat us in the present and commit to a better life by changing those things right by changing who we are in in sometimes changing means not doing it anymore that's it <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and also doing perhaps trying the opposite of of what you've been doing first mm -hmm. of all recognizing what you've been doing and then doing the opposite and seeing what comes up for you so if somebody has a self-defeating mechanism they use say they uh they drink every night and they don't want to so i would say if you drink every night say you have two drinks every night and you want to stop drinking and it's all seven days a week what happens if you drink one drink a night instead of two you think you, you finish your first drink and you really want the second one. I know people are going to start stirring because I'm talking about addiction, but I have a whole, I can do 17 podcasts on addiction. <laughs> but, so yeah, but just bear with me on this. If you have the first drink and you want your second one and you go to pour it and you're pouring it, that's your, one of your MOs right there. Your defense is to pour the second drink. Really, it's to pour the first drink too, but the second drink. What if you don't pour it? What if you, if you freeze for 10 seconds? And you just breathe, do some centered breathing and check in with yourself. What's going on underneath, mm -hmm. underneath the, the desire for the drink right there. You'll get to the root of what the two drinks a night has been trying to modify what it's trying to avoid, what it's trying to distract from, what it's trying to divert from, what it's trying to placate. That's what your MOs, your defense mechanisms have been doing. See, as a kid, when you were five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years old, you weren't drinking, but you were doing something else to avoid ever getting pain again. Maybe you started lying to your parents or you started climbing out the window when you were grounded so they wouldn't see you. Or you, uh, I know somebody who had a meal every single night and because they were being forced to eat food they didn't want, they would flatten out the food and separate it to make it look that they had more than they had. Wow. For a six-year-old to figure that out, that's, there's a certain sadness that comes up when I think about that because they could not tell them they just don't like their food. They just don't want to eat it. Can they have something else? So they had to learn how to strategize. And as adults, they're doing the same thing. They're sneaking around. They're flattening out their food, metaphorically speaking. They do it in all kinds of ways. You know, they're being very underhanded instead of telling someone directly, look, I don't like this. Can, we, can I have something else? You know, instead, they'd rather just hide. So when you have the, going for the second drink or when you're going to flatten out your food, you know, metaphorically speaking, what's there for you? the fear of being shamed or uh, what kind of fear is it there for you? What kind of vulnerability? What do you feel? What comes up for you? Let yourself sit with that and then ask yourself, okay, do you still need the, the drink? And you might say, well, yes, you might say, yes, I do, but do you? That's what the drink is doing. You know, that's what became self-defeating is be, the flattening out of the food became the two drinks a night mm -hmm. as you became an adult to avoid some sort of a feeling that you don't want to have pain. Like you said earlier, so if you could sit with the pain, because it hurt. It, it, that's, it's, I, when I tell that story, it wasn't even my story, and I get sad. That's so sad that a six-year-old has to do that with their food every single night because they don't like what they're eating. I mean, what is this, Oliver Twist? I mean, come on. You know, <laughs> you know it, it, it's like, uh, so that's what I would suggest to do. Whatever, is, whatever you think is your self-defeating um, MO, ask yourself to freeze before you do it. Like, I can't control myself. I have no impulse control. I'm, I go to the fridge and I eat this and whatever it is, gambling, ask yourself to freeze. What are you feeling right now? What's underneath? And if you could sit with that, then you could choose. Can you sit with this for a bit and not, like you said, not think? Don't, don't tell a story about the feelings. Just have them. Or do you need to pour yourself a second drink? And eventually you'll find that you can 
break down. You won't be seven days a week. It'll be four days a week that you're having two drinks. Or it'll be four days a week. Now you're having only one drink. And all of a sudden you're drinking less and less. And then drinking still would be your go-to, but it's still, but it won't be as automatic and habitual and seemingly without any sense of control. You know, because people say, I have no control. That's not true. You have this, you have the fallacy that you have no control because that part of you has taken over. Your MOs have taken over. I can't help it. I'm a perfectionist. You can help it. It's not a question of you can't help it. Your perfectionist part of self has hijacked you for so long that you think you can't help it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't. You have control over who you're being. It's just a question of what you have to be with when you're not being who you're always being. Mm -hmm. And it's also true that we can't control what happens to us, you know, what or the the things around us, but we can control how we react to those things. And we've said that on our um, Facebook page. And I think it's Mm -hmm. it's it's what's important about meditation is to me is when we sit and we're not moving our bodies and we, you know, gaining more control over our movements, that's one thing. And then the second thing is when we have more control over our mind and the things that come up and be able to have a, a blank slate in our minds as we wish. And that's, that's really hard. And, but it, it does, you know, when we practice, it does get better with time and, and, you know, nobody's perfect. So we got to keep that in mind as well. And, and that's why this is all a practice, right? We're practicing to become better people to learn ways to to stop defeating ourselves. And more than anything, the idea is to live in the present and be happy in the present. So, you know, if there's anything that's not allowing you to do that, that's where, you know, we you need to stop doing that and, and learn why you're doing that and then uh, change it to the things that you want to be doing in, in, in the present. And so hopefully that's mm-hmm. that does it. Um, any last words before we end today's podcast, Neil? Yeah, there's uh, one thing to keep in mind is there's a difference between um, responding and reacting. Mm -hmm. Responding is when you have an emotional, visceral response to something that just happened. Reaction is what you do about it, your actions and behaviors that follow. So remember when you're looking at your MOs and your defense mechanisms and your self-defeating behaviors that you're going to have a response, which is emotional when something happens. How you react is your choice. Response is automatic. It is because it comes from your limbic system in your past, but your reaction is up to you. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to react the same way. So the idea of altering MOs or defense mechanisms is how you're going to react. So you don't have to react to somebody's negativity. You don't have to react to somebody uh, uh, starting conflict. You don't have to, somebody says something that viscerally uh, elicits something in you. You don't have to react by answering them back or by putting in your two cents. And then you could see how your patterns can start to alter if you don't react the same way you've normally done. So That's also another strategy. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for everyone for listening. And remember, we're here every Tuesday at 6 p.m. on every platform that you listen to your podcast. So please uh, subscribe and leave us more comments and questions. We would love to answer them on the air. And hopefully uh, we'll have some guests soon as we already had um, Dr. I mean, Mr. Uh, Jesus R. Sorry. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And remember, we're also on YouTube, so you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, also, you can look me up, uh, Robert Aceves, and you can find some of my meditations on YouTube that can definitely help you with all the stuff we talked about today. So hopefully this was helpful to you all, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Bye, Neil. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by MindFit. Please help us to share this podcast with your friends and family to grow this community. And if you'd like to donate to this podcast, or if you'd like to share your comments, questions, or concerns, send them to mindfitpodcast at gmail.com, or you can call us directly at 714-328-4661.